Hey all my fellow crime connoisseurs, I'm your host Grace D, and to kick off our very first episode, we're visiting my home state of New Jersey with a story of love, betrayal, and murder. This is the case of Maria Marshall. of September 7th, 1984, Robert Marshall, an insurance broker who is often referred to as Rob, so throughout the case that's what I'll call him, and his wife Maria, a socialite and stay-at-home mom, were on their way home after a night of gambling, which they usually did at Harris Marina Casino in Atlantic City, New Jersey. On their way home, Rob felt like one of his tires was soft, so he pulled into the Oyster Creek picnic area on the Garden State Parkway to check it out. Around 12.30 a.m., Rob desperately tried to flag down vehicles passing near the picnic area entrance. When he finally got a car to stop, he told them to call the police and that his wife had been shot. The driver drove to the next available payphone and notified the police of their encounter with Rob. They then returned to the picnic area and found Rob walking around with what seemed to be a head wound and his wife Maria was dead in the passenger seat of their 1980 Cadillac Eldorado. When the police arrived, Rob told them they had been heading home from Atlantic City. He thought one of the rear tires felt low, so he pulled off the parkway and into the picnic area. Now, I'm going to describe the location for you guys so you have an idea of where it was that Rob pulled off to back then. The picnic area was awfully dark. Despite just being off the busy Garden State Parkway, the picnic area with the tables and trash cans, it was particularly well shielded from the roadway. The masses of evergreen trees surrounding the area muffled the noises of passing cars. Rob had apparently pulled in and stopped roughly 100 feet from the end of the asphalt blacktop and from where an unlit cinder block restroom stood. The right rear tire of the vehicle was completely flat. When the police checked Maria for a pulse, they couldn't find one. Rob told police that while he was down looking at the tire, he heard another vehicle pull into the picnic area, but he didn't see nor hear anyone get out of their car. While looking at the tire, Rob stated that he was hit on the head and knocked out. When he woke up, he was in a pool of blood that was coming from his head, his winnings from the casino were gone, and Maria was dead in the passenger seat. Rob was taken from the scene to a nearby hospital for his head injury, where he received five stitches. Soon after, a St. Joseph's Catholic Church priest arrived and took Rob home around 3 a.m. to tell two of his sons, Robbie the oldest and John the youngest, that their mom had been murdered. Rob told them that they had stopped at the Oyster Creek picnic area to check on the car's tire and Maria was killed after he was knocked out. Rob told his sons that the person must have followed them from the casino after seeing all the money he won earlier that night and robbed them. Shortly after Rob had returned home, detectives with the New Jersey State Police and investigators with the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office arrived around 5 a.m. They asked him to make a formal statement with them at the Bass River State Police Barracks. When Rob returned home, it was just as the murder was announced on the news. Soon after, friends and family started to call and stop by to give their condolences. Rob told everyone his story of that night was that someone must have seen how he won more than two grand at the blackjack table and followed them from the casino. They must have followed him into the picnic area when he had pulled in to check on the tire without him knowing. After getting out to inspect the tire, he was knocked out. When he awoke, blood was coming from his head, the money was gone from his pocket, and Maria was face down across the car's front passenger seat in a pool of blood. Later that morning, Rob drove to Lehigh University to tell Chris, the middle son, the news of his mom's murder. Rob had also arranged to have Maria's body cremated and scheduled her funeral for Monday, September 10th. Robbie was having a hard time with his mom's death, and felt that his dad was holding up and functioning better than he even was. Family members, including Rob's brother-in-law, Joseph Doherty, who was an attorney, started to arrive. Joseph was married to Rob's sister, Oakley. 
In a private conversation, he informed Rob that he knew about the affair that Rob had been having for over the past year with Sarah Ann Crosshair and advised him to come clean about it. The Marshalls and the Crosshairs were members of the same country club. Joseph told Rob how Maria knew about the affair after she found hotel receipts and phone bills. The phone bill showed over 50 calls a month with a number to a local high school where Sarah Ann was the vice principal. Rob admitted to the affair, saying he was having a midlife crisis. He told Joseph he felt depressed, was uninterested in his job, and that he and Sarah Ann were in love. Rob said his relationship with Sarah Ann was like nothing he had ever felt. He told Joseph how he and Sarah Ann planned to leave their spouses, buy a place, and start their lives together. They even had a safety deposit box where they passed messages to each other, such as cassette tapes and letters. Rob also admitted to having some financial difficulties. The Marshalls were over $300,000 in debt. That's about $863,821 today for an increase of $563,000 over the last 38 years. To put that into perspective, at the time, Rob had a gross income of $130,000. He was living well above his means with a debt that his income just couldn't cover. By August of 1984, banks and credit card companies wouldn't extend him any loans nor increase his spending limits, and he continuously blamed it on Maria's spending habits. Maria knew about everything and was going to confront Rob about all of it on Monday, September 10th, which would now be the day of her funeral. Joseph decided to drop one more bombshell on Rob, which was how Maria had hired a private detective to follow him. Rob replied, if he had known about the private detective, none of this would have happened. Joseph questioned what that was supposed to mean. Rob said that if he knew Maria had known about the affair, he would have ended their marriage sooner and they wouldn't have been in Atlantic City that night. Joseph then asked him if he had any life insurance out of Maria, and Rob told him that he did and that it was a good sales strategy. He was an insurance salesman after all. How much life insurance, you ask? Well, according to Rob, at the time of his wife's death, Maria was worth $1.5 million. Today, in 2023, that's approximately $4,319,105. At the end of their conversation, Joseph gave Rob some crucial advice. The advice was first to tell his boys about the affair before they were to hear about it on the news. Second, given that Joseph worked for a neighboring state's attorney general's office, he pointed out how this looked. The husband was having an affair and planned on leaving his wife. The husband has serious financial difficulties and there's a $1.5 million life insurance policy on the wife. Sometime after midnight, the wife is shot to death in the husband's car in a remote picnic area where the husband pulled off to check a tire and the husband only sustains a minor head injury. Rob heard what his brother-in-law expressed, but replied that there was no possible way the police would consider him a suspect. He felt he was too distinguished in Tom's River, placing him above suspicion. The last bit of advice that Joseph gave to Rob was for him to get a lawyer, but he had already done that. Some of Rob's inner circle weren't buying what he was telling people. People questioned why he would stop at the Oyster Creek picnic area. It was dark and secluded, and about four miles up the road, there was a Roy Rogers that was open 24 hours, which would have been a good place to stop. Others who knew Rob never saw him lift a finger to do manual labor and could not see him changing a tire. Another issue about everything was that Rob had Maria's body cremated within hours of her murder. This occurred before the prosecutor's office or even the state police could stop her body from being released. Maria Marshall's autopsy showed two bullet wounds that were about three millimeters apart that had entered through her back. The exit wounds were located in the front of her chest and the other through her left breast. The bullet wounds were made at a very close range and a 45 caliber bullet was lodged in her left forearm. When the New Jersey State Police arrived, Maria was found lying down with her left arm under her. The cause of death was ruled massive hemorrhage due to the laceration of the left lung and the main artery in the chest. Police investigators impounded the Marshall's Cadillac Eldorado. Upon examining the rear tire, investigators found that it had a clean one inch cut in it as if it had been slid open by a knife and that the tire did not have any indications of being driven on while flat or low. 
The detectives investigating the murder were contacted by Maria's divorce lawyer with information. When it was time to move forward with the divorce proceedings, Maria decided to try and save her marriage and hold off on doing anything. Maria's attorney gave the detectives a note that he had received from her stating that she had more information, including three telephone numbers with the Louisiana area code. Police brought Sarah Ann in for questioning, going as far as to handcuff and fingerprint her. She immediately invoked her right to counsel. She did end up talking to the police with her attorney, telling them that she and Rob had begun their affair in June of 1983. She confirmed that they were, in fact, both planning on leaving their spouses in the near future. After conferring with her attorney, Sarah Ann told investigators how Rob asked if she knew anyone who could get rid of Maria. Getting rid of her would solve all of his problems. Sarah Ann claims that she told Rob that she didn't know of anyone except for one woman and that this woman's family allegedly had ties to organized crime. Sarah Ann said that if Rob was serious, she couldn't be with him. From the numbers that Maria had provided to her attorney, police tracked one down as belonging to Robert Cumber, a hardware store clerk in Louisiana. I'll refer to him as Cumber going forward. Police from the prosecutor's office paid Cumber a visit and brought on to the local authorities for more questioning. Cumber told authorities that he met Rob and Maria Marshall at a family friend's birthday party in May of 1984. This just so happened to be the family friend with alleged ties to organized crime that Sarah Ann told Rob about. Rob and Cumber talked about IRAs and if he knew anyone he could hire as an investigator since he didn't want to use anyone local. When Rob later phoned Cumber, Cumber referred him to Billy Wayne McKinnon. Billy Wayne McKinnon was a former police detective. McKinnon had agreed to come to Atlantic City to meet Rob for $5,000. Police went to the Marshall residence to speak with Rob when they returned to New Jersey. When they arrived, Sarah Ann and Robbie were also present. They asked Rob if he knew or had heard the name of Jimmy Davis from Shreveport, Louisiana or a Billy Wayne McKinnon. Rob was visibly shaken up, but told the detectives that on the advice of his attorney, he was not to answer any questions, no matter what. A call came into the Marshall residence days later, and Robbie took a phone message from Jimmy Davis, asking that Rob contact him immediately. Rob was with Sarah Ann at her Ortley Beach condo when they realized there was a message on the machine. Sarah Ann played the message Robbie left for his dad, relaying that Jimmy Davis called and wanted a call back immediately. When Rob came home, Robbie questioned the call with Jimmy Davis. He mentioned how Rob said he didn't know anybody by that name. Rob told him that he had met Davis a long time ago. He told him that he had lost a bet on a basketball game and wired Davis' winnings, but he didn't know why Davis would be contacting him now. Robbie indicated that his father never watched any NBA games. After his conversation with Robbie, Rob called Sarah Ann, but much to his surprise, she ended things between them. On September 26, 1984, the news broke that Robert Cumber was indicted by a grand jury in Ocean County. He was being charged with the conspiracy to commit murder in connection with Maria Marshall's death. Cumber was an intermediary who passed messages between Rob Marshall and Billy Wayne McKinnon. They were primarily Rob asking McKinnon to call him. Cumber had 31 phone calls from Rob, including one the day before the murder. Cumber was a former Air Force clerk and a current hardware store clerk with no criminal history up to this point. The very next day, on September 27th, Rob checked into room 16 of the Best Western Hotel in Lakewood, New Jersey. He recorded four messages, one for each of his sons and one for his brother-in-law. He planned on committing suicide but fell asleep after mixing 50 Ristoral sleeping pills in a can of Coca-Cola. Ocean County detectives assigned to watch Rob contacted a local rescue squad. They feared he might take his own life when he failed to answer a call to his room at 1 a.m. Rob was transported to a local hospital and was fine. His attorney had him transported to a psychiatric facility near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and police confiscated the tapes. The police started putting everything together at this point. They determined that Rob and McKinnon met on June 18, 1984 at Harris Casino in Atlantic City. Rob offered to pay him $65,000 to kill his wife. This was in addition to the $5,000 he had already paid him. Rob paid another $7,000 and provided a picture of Maria. He wanted the hit to be carried out that night. McKinnon said it wasn't the right time and instead returned to Louisiana. 
McKinnon returned to Atlantic City on July 19, 1984, and met with Rob. Rob insisted to McKinnon that he wanted the job done that night when he and Maria would be out. Rob planned to leave Maria in the car and go into a restaurant to use their facilities. While Rob was away from the car, McKinnon would carry out the hit and make it look like a robbery. McKinnon failed to complete the job this night because the parking lot that Rob chose was well lit and busy. Rob was desperate to have the murder completed. He offered McKinnon an extra $15,000 if he returned before Labor Day. McKinnon did so on September 6, 1984. He met Rob at a service parking area south of Tom's River. They searched for a site where the murder could be carried out. Again, Rob wanted it to be made to look like a robbery. Earlier that day, Rob and Maria took Robbie out to lunch. They told him how they were going to go out to Atlantic City later that night for dinner and gambling. Around 9.30 p.m., Rob excused himself and met McKinnon outside the casino. He told him they would be leaving around midnight, gave him $800, and said the other $15,000 would be found in his pocket. Rob also asked for the photographs of Maria and his residence that he had given McKinnon back in June to be returned. While they were at dinner at around 10 p.m., Rob had a phone brought over to the table. He called Chris at Lehigh and told him they missed him and wanted to check in on how he was doing. He asked Chris to come home for a visit since the last time he'd seen his parents was when they dropped him off at Lehigh on August 24th, 1984. Now we're back to the murder. At around 12.30 a.m., Robert Marshall pulled into a prearranged meeting spot at mile marker 71 on the Garden State Parkway at the Oyster Creek picnic area. McKinnon had already dropped off Larry Thompson, the shooter, at the picnic area. McKinnon then drove southbound on the Garden State Parkway to turn around and re-enter the northbound lane, waiting for Rob to pass by. After Rob drove by, McKinnon waited approximately two minutes before he followed Rob back to the picnic area. Maria was lying across the front seat when Rob exited the car on the pretense of looking at a flat tire. He squatted down and was hit on the head, all according to their plan. Maria was then shot twice in the back and died soon after. Thompson was to take the $15,000 from Rob's pocket, but only found two grand of the agreed upon amount. When McKinnon arrived, he ran back to the Cadillac, squatted down by the rear tire, and then he cut it with a knife. Rob Marshall was arrested on December 19th and held on a $2 million bail. At a hearing on December 24th, Edward J. Turnbach, the Ocean County prosecutor, asked that Rob be held without bail. This required a showing that there was a reasonable likelihood that he would be convicted and that the death penalty would be imposed. In supporting his request, Turnbach offered in into evidence a 25-page statement by McKinnon, who had testified before the state grand jury here after his extradition. Judge Huber read the McKinnon statement, used it as a basis for revoking bail, and sealed it at the request of Turnbach. Glenn A. Zietz, attorney for Rob, agreed that the statement should be kept secret until McKinnon could be cross-examined at trial. Several newspapers contended that they needed the information in the statement to evaluate what was happening at the bail hearing, and they asked Judge Huber to reverse his order. After a hearing, the judge refused to reverse his order, stating that if the statement was released, even with a change of venue, it could not guarantee the possibility of obtaining an impartial jury because you can assume potential jurors in any county where the trial would be held would have read or heard about a complete statement of a co-conspirator in the papers and that it would be published shortly before the trial begins. Turnbach told the judge before his ruling, it is the position of this state that this defendant should be tried, convicted, and executed but that he should receive a fair trial first. Judge Huber said there was a delicate balance between the First Amendment rights of the press and public to access pretrial proceedings and the Sixth Amendment right of the accused to a fair trial. He said Rob's rights were paramount in this case because there would be no way to block out the devastating statement of Billy Wayne McKinnon from the minds of potential jurors. On January 28, 1986, the trials of Robert O. Marshall and Larry Thompson commenced in Atlantic County. Both were charged with first-degree murder with special circumstances, meaning this was going to be a death penalty case. 
Judge Manuel H. Greenberg presided, and Kevin Kelly, the assistant Ocean County prosecutor, represented the state. In opening statements, Kelly laid out the prosecution's case. Rob had solicited and paid for the murder of his wife so he could collect $1.5 million in life insurance, pay off his debts, and continue his relationship with his married mistress. The state's key witness, Billy Wayne McKinnon, an accused co-conspirator, would testify to these facts. The defense attorney for Rob Marshall was Glenn Zietz, and Larry Thompson's defense attorney was Francis Hartman. Hartman indicated that his client was only here because McKinnon needed a fall guy to get his incredible deal, and that the evidence suggested that McKinnon was the actual shooter. Larry Thompson's wife, Wanda Diane Thompson, and their son were in attendance. Since her husband's arrest, Wanda Thompson had been residing at the Marshall residence. Also in attendance, besides various reporters and curiosity seekers, was writer Joe McGinnis, who wrote the book Blind Faith about this case. Billy Wayne McKinnon was a former Cato Parish detective in Shreveport, Louisiana, turned private investigator. He was the state's star witness. He agreed to testify against Rob and Larry for a plea deal for a lighter sentence, five years in prison. McKinnon testified that he had met Rob in Atlantic City in June of 1984. He was retained to kill Maria Marshall for $65,000. He said he returned to New Jersey in July of 1984 with his friend Michael Gentry, but failed to carry out the hit. McKinnon returned for a final time in September of 1984. This time, he brought Larry Thompson along to complete the hit. Up to that point, he was paid a total of $22,000 and was expected to receive the rest once Rob collected the life insurance that he had taken out on his wife. The defense tried to paint McKinnon as a liar. He was the one who carried out the shooting and exaggerated the amount of money being paid for him to do so to get a deal from the state and avoid the death penalty. At trial, the state introduced all of the life insurance policies that Rob Marshall had taken out on Maria. This included a $130,000 policy just hours before she was murdered. The total payout was close to $1.5 million, with $600,000 set aside for his children. Eight insurance companies also testified to Rob taking out policies in the year before Maria's murder. Sarah Ann testified about her 14-month affair with Rob Marshall and their conversation in December of 1983. Rob confessed to her that he was $300,000 in debt, blaming it on Maria's spending habits. He said that if he could just get rid of her, his insurance on Maria would cover his debts. Sarah Ann admitted to continuing their affair for 18 days after Maria's murder until she broke it off. She no longer believed that what Rob had told her about his connections to the individuals from Louisiana was true. Sarah Ann had been at the Marshall residence the night the police had shown Rob pictures of McKinnon and James Davis. They asked him if he knew them, which he denied. Two days later, when she and Rob returned to her condo at Ortley Beach, there was a phone message from Robbie telling him that he was to call a number from Louisiana. McKinnon testified that he had called the Marshall residence that day. James Davis was initially indicted on conspiracy to commit murder charges. He also became a material witness and testified to picking up $5,500 that Rob Marshall had wired McKinnon. Rob took the stand in his own defense. He claimed he didn't hire McKinnon to kill his wife just to investigate what Maria knew about his affair and what she did with the casino winnings he had been given her. McKinnon's earlier testimony stated that Rob had paid him approximately $22,500 for the murder. Rob testified that it was only $6,300 for the investigation into his wife. On cross-examination, Kelly asked if he had received a write-up on the investigation that he had hired McKinnon to conduct, including any receipts for the money he had paid him. The answer was no. Rob also testified that while checking out the right rear tire, just before he was hit on the head, he heard Maria cry out, oh my God. This was a surprise to his sons. They had always thought their mother was asleep when she was shot, unaware of what was coming. On cross-examination in what could only be described as a Perry Mason moment, Prosecutor Kelly reiterated Rob's testimony that he loved his wife and his undying love for her. The prosecutor then asked him, why were Maria's ashes still in a box at the funeral home? 
Rob replied that they were planning on burying her in Florida, but he got arrested before that could happen. Rob had three months from Maria's funeral until his arrest to at least pick up her ashes from the funeral home. He did not do so, and he went to Florida alone in that three months and began a relationship with Karen O'Dell. Karen and her husband had lived in Tom's River before moving to Florida and had been friends with the Marshalls. Closing arguments were held on March 3, 1986. Prosecutor Kelly stated in his closing arguments, But the defendant is a coward. He's self-centered. He's greedy. He's desperate. He's materialistic. And he's a liar. The court instructed the jury on March 4th, and the jury returned with its verdict late in the morning of March 5th, 1986, convicting Robert O. Marshall of murder and conspiracy to commit murder and sentencing him to death. Larry Thompson was acquitted of the charges and walked away a free man after the judge read the verdicts. While escorted from the courtroom after the verdict was read, Rob fainted. An ambulance took Rob to the hospital, where he was examined at 12.30 p.m., then discharged approximately 50 minutes later. He returned to the courtroom about 15 to 20 minutes after that to resume the penalty phase. During Rob's absence, Zietz consulted with the prosecution regarding the penalty phase, and they agreed on how they would proceed. Of the three aggravating factors charged by the prosecution— one, that the defendant procured the commission of the murder by payment or promise of payment of anything of pecuniary value. Two, murder for the pecuniary gain. And three, the heinous nature of the offense. The state agreed to argue only the first of those factors, based on its case that Rob had hired someone to kill his wife. The prosecution further agreed to stipulate the single mitigating factor Rob had no prior criminal record. The defense counsel would retain the right to argue of the second of its two filed mitigating factors. The catch-all, which provides that the jury may consider any other factor which is relevant to the defendant's character or record or to the circumstances of the offense. But both the prosecution and the defense would break wave openings and limit themselves to a single short closing statement to the jury. Upon Rob's return from the hospital, Zietz briefly conferred with his client. The penalty phase convened shortly after that at about 1.45 p.m. the same day. Outside the jury's presence, but on the record, the parties explained their agreement to the judge, who allowed them to go forward as agreed. Zietz was the first to address the jury from the agreement and presented his statement to them. The ending of his statement had me raising my eyebrows a bit. I obtained a copy of the court transcript through the digital commons of Villanova University's law school. I'm going to read you guys the ending and let's see if you have the same reaction as I did. One thing I have to tell you about this, which I think makes it an individual decision for each one of you, and that is that the only way that the death penalty can be imposed is if all 12 of you agree to do it unanimously, so that you, in essence, have a power in your hands that, quite candidly, I would never have in my hands because as a lawyer, we generally don't serve as jurors, so I have no way of knowing what it must be like. All I can say is this, that I hope when you individually consider the death penalty, that you're each able to reach whatever opinion you find in your own heart and that whatever you feel is the just thing to do, we can live with it. After only 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury sentenced Robert O. Marshall to die by lethal injection. The jury unanimously found, beyond a reasonable doubt, the existence of the aggravating factors and evidence of the existence of both mitigating factors. However, it concluded unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the aggravating factor outweighed the mitigating factors. In 1986, Cumber was convicted as an accomplice and would receive 30 years in prison with no chance for parole. Cumber could have faced a lesser charge if he had taken a plea, but he didn't. He took his chances at trial, which didn't turn out well for him. In 2002, Rob published a book entitled Tunnel Vision, Trial and Error. It was his attempt to show that he was not guilty of the crime that he was convicted of and how he was framed. In 2006, 
Cumber received clemency from Governor Richard Cody after serving 20 years. At the age of 68, he returned to Cushada, Louisiana, and was reunited with his wife and daughter. Rob Marshall filed numerous appeals over two decades. The proceedings were the subject of extensive judicial review. Rob claimed that Zietz rendered ineffective assistance of counsel during the trial's penalty phase. Rob appealed to the court multiple times, leveling the following claims of ineffectiveness at the penalty phase. One, the penalty phase should not have commenced immediately upon Rob's return from the hospital. Two, Zietz presented no mitigating evidence, even though the judge instructed the jury to decide if the existence of mitigating factors based on the evidence. Three, Zietz failed to offer evidence to humanize Rob, such as describing his childhood, his commitment to family, and his extensive community service. Four, Zietz's statement to the jury was extremely brief and contained no request for mercy. Five, Zietz never discussed the penalty phase with Rob. And six, Zietz never prepared for the penalty phase and conducted no investigation. So this is why I have my eyebrows raising. When you read Zietz's closing argument and he says to the jury how he would never be able to understand what they're going through and what it must be like because as a lawyer, he typically would never serve on a jury. It's kind of like, okay, but you are a defense counsel and you are supposed to be pleading for your client's life here because now this is for the sentencing part of a death penalty case. So it almost comes off very arrogant in a sense. I mean, that's just my opinion and everybody is entitled to theirs. But me reading it, I'm like, ooh, that, that left a bad taste in, in my mouth when, when I realized that. And then at the end when he's saying, you know, when each reach into you deep down and whatever you decide, we can live with it. If I'm Rob Marshall and my defense attorney is saying, oh, whatever you decide, we can live with it. Yeah, I'll be doing the same thing that Rob Marshall's doing, filing the appeals for ineffective of counsel, because no, no, it's easy for you to say you're not the one looking at a needle in the arm. But again, that's, that's just me. That's my opinion. I would love to know what you guys think. So please like drop comments in the, you know, in the Instagram post, shoot me an email. Let's just everyone be respectful to one another because we're all entitled to our opinions. I'm going to agree with some things or disagree with some things, but that doesn't mean that anyone is more right or wrong or anything like that. It's just we'll respectfully agree and disagree. That's all. In its comprehensive and incisive opinion, the District 27 Court addressed several aspects of Zeta's penalty phase assistance and grouped six individual allegations of deficient performance into two overreaching categories. One, Lack of consultation, preparation, and investigation by counsel, pre-penalty. Zietz failed to prepare for or investigate a case for life. Zietz failed to discuss the penalty phase with Rob. And Zietz failed to request an adjournment and permitted the penalty phase to commence immediately after Rob's return from the hospital. Two, lack of content or substance in counsel's representation at the penalty phase. Zietz failed to present mitigating evidence during the penalty phase. Zietz failed to humanize Rob. And Zietz failed to make a plea for his client's life. The district court concluded that although the state court had identified the correct legal principles governing Rob's claims of ineffectiveness, namely Strickland, for anyone who may not be familiar with Strickland v. Washington, it was a monumental case with the Supreme Court that established the standard for determining when a criminal defendant's Sixth Amendment right to counsel is violated by that counsel's inadequate performance. Because of this, the decision to deny Rob relief was not contrary to established Supreme Court precedent. The state court's application of that precedent to find that Zietz's representation had been effective was objectively unreasonable. Because of this, the district court concluded Rob was entitled to relief under the AEDPA, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. Concerning the adequacy of investigation, preparation, and consultation, 
The district court found neither Rob's intractableness as a client nor Zietz's claims that he had gathered sufficient mitigating evidence, even though not as part of a penalty phase investigation, rendered Zietz effective or his conduct reasonable. The court stated that, at a bare minimum, Zietz was required to have specific discussions with Rob and his family members about the possibility of a penalty phase, what a penalty phase entails, and a discussion with each person individually as to whether he or she would have been willing to testify and what he or she would have said. The district court detailed that the apparent plethora of potentially useful mitigating witnesses available to the defense at the time of trial discussing the substances of what more than 15 witnesses had testified they would have said about Rob had they been asked to take the stand on his behalf during the 1986 penalty phase. The list of would-be mitigating witnesses includes family members, childhood friends, neighbors, and business associates. Here, Zietz's representation fell below the professional standard because he failed to conduct any investigation into possible mitigating factors and provides no objectively reasonable justification for failing to do so. One aspect of Zietz's pre-penalty performance that the district court found not to have fallen below constitutional standards was the failure to obtain records or documentary evidence of Rob's charitable activities. On this point, the district court concluded, we are satisfied that Zietz acted reasonably. In light of his total lack of preparation, the district court found Zietz's decision not to ask the trial court for a continuance before continuing with the commencement of the penalty phase was even more unbelievable. The court said, We are convinced that no reasonable attorney in Zietz's position would have gone forward without adjourning. Zietz did not have a single witness ready to testify, nor was he aware of any useful mitigating evidence aside from the cursory understanding of Rob's charitable work and the fact that he had no prior criminal record. By Zietz's decision to move forward also ensured that Rob's family would not be present during the proceedings because Rob's sister Oakley had taken John and other family members home earlier in the day, mistakenly believing that the penalty phase would not start that afternoon. Rob Marshall was resentenced based on a federal court decision regarding ineffective counsel in his 1986 trial after spending 18 years on New Jersey's death row. Rob was sentenced to 30 years with the eligibility for parole in 2006. In fact, he was granted a parole board hearing scheduled for March 18, 2015, 29 years and 13 days after being sentenced to death by lethal injection. Rob, however, never met with the 15-member parole board. On Saturday, February 24, 2015, Robert Oakley Marshall died at the Southwood State Prison in Bridgeton, New Jersey from natural causes. Rob was 75 years old. He never admitted his guilt, nor ever showed remorse for his actions. He only ever stated that he made mistakes. But the question remains, who shot Maria Marshall? In 2014, Larry Thompson was 71 years old. He had served 12 years on a 50-year sentence in Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola for a 2003 armored car robbery and his part in the attempted murder of a Shreveport police officer. He admitted to his role in the Maria Marshall murder and confessed to being the actual shooter. Due to double jeopardy, Thompson cannot be prosecuted again. As we know, double jeopardy was designed to protect a person so they cannot be tried twice for the same crime based on the same conduct. During Thompson's trial, his son Brian had testified that his father took him to the dentist in Louisiana on the day of the shooting. Thompson's wife Wanda had also testified that Larry had taken their son to the dentist that day. That day, a receipt from the dentist's office had been made out to Larry Thompson. Since then, they've both admitted that they lied, but the statute of limitations for perjury in New Jersey is five years. This was apparently plotted while he was in jail in New Jersey awaiting trial. Thompson confessed to his role in the murder in an interview with James A. Churchill. He was the former lieutenant in charge of Maria Marshall's murder investigation. Churchill was chief of the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office when he retired. James Churchill was in Shreveport to assist local authorities in a cold case investigation from 1979 in which a woman, Deanna Elliott Montgomery, had been murdered on January 1, 1979. 
Her murder had striking similarities to Maria Marshall's case. Deanna was sitting in the passenger seat of a car driven by her husband, James Haywood Montgomery, when Thompson fired a single shotgun blast into the vehicle. This murder took place in Cato Parish. Montgomery and Thompson were friends, and police believed that they were both involved at the time, but couldn't prove it. Montgomery had taken out a life insurance policy on his wife, and $15,000 would go to Thompson for the hit. In May of 2013, James Montgomery was charged with the aggravated rape of a family member. That charge was dismissed the same day after he entered into a plea arrangement regarding his wife's murder. Authorities would not say why they dropped the rape charges. Thompson never got his payment of $15,000. Instead, Montgomery gave him a Dodge van and a four-wheel drive truck that Thompson later returned. During this time, Thompson confessed to two more murders one in DeSoto Parish in Louisiana, and one in Harrison County, Texas. In 2016, Thompson was sentenced to 21 years in prison as part of a plea agreement he reached with the Cato District Attorney's Office for manslaughter. He admitting to executing Deanna after being paid by her husband. Deanna's husband received a five-year sentence with time served in March 2016 for manslaughter. After ending the affair, Sarah Ann resigned as vice principal of Pinelands Regional High School in Tuckerton, New Jersey. Sarah Ann reunited with her husband and they opened a chain of blockbuster video stores. She and her husband moved to Naples, Florida. And although she's officially retired, Sarah Ann retains ownership in the auto dealerships known as Lester Glen Auto Group in New Jersey, operated by her son. So where are the Marshall boys now? Earlier in the episode, I mentioned Joe McGinnis being at the trial. McGinnis wrote the book Blind Faith about Maria Marshall's case in 1989, and in 1990, NBC created a television miniseries based on the book and case. Robbie assisted on set during filming to assure things were portrayed as accurately as possible. While filming the television miniseries, actress Joanne Kearns, who played Maria Marshall, introduced her Growing Pains co-star Tracy Gold to the oldest Marshall son, Robbie. Tracy and Robbie were married in October of 1994, and they now have four children and reside in California, and Robbie is a teacher. In 1996, Chris Marshall was charged with domestic assault, where his wife of a little more than a year accused him of assaulting her after she became enraged having learned that he was with his mistress on the night their daughter was born. The charge was later dismissed. After serving many years as the Lehigh varsity swim coach, Chris accepted the position with Cornell University as Senior Vice President for Alumni Affairs, where at the time of telling this case, he still remains. In 2006, he publicly stated he believed his father was guilty of murdering his mother. Little information is available about the youngest Marshall's son, John, other than as of 2006, he still believed in his father's innocence and was instrumental in having his father's sentence commuted to life in prison with the eligibility of parole. Maria Marshall was a beautiful and elegant woman. Although her sons were teenagers and generally of the age where her parents were an embarrassment and typically evenings at home with mom and dad were not wanted, all three of Maria's sons adored her. Maria was a loyal wife and a fiercely devoted mother who rallied behind her children, encouraging them, and was delighted with the young men they were becoming. And that's the case of Maria Marshall. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. All the research info on this case is in the show notes. You can find and subscribe to Crime Connoisseurs wherever you get your podcast, and be sure to follow on Instagram at Crime Connoisseurs for news, updates, and case information. Feel free to reach out with case suggestions too. Keep it classy, connoisseurs, and I'll catch you on the next case.